the beneficent, the malignant, the and the most merciful. Behold, God enjoins justice and the doing of good and generosity towards fellow man. Chapter 16, verse 19. When looking at the day-to-day -day affairs of people, is there room for such a word? In conversation, would you say such a word? In your actions or thoughts, would such a word take effect? A word such as justice has been the heartbeat of so many, including those who are dearest to the religion of Islam. When it comes to justice, Imam Hussain has painted a path that all can identify, lead to the way of those who are just. But can his sacrifice for truth over falsehood be found by those who have never met him? Join David Whitford on his journey as he endeavors to find out who is the same. David is a 48-year-old actor who has been assigned the task of finding out who Imam Hussain is. Prior to this point, he has never inquired about the Muslim world and has agreed to embark on this journey. He will first meet Chris Hewer, a well-known Christian scholar who is well-versed in Islamic history and theology. Prophet Muhammad was born around the year 570. And then when he was 25, so about 595, he marries his first wife, Khadija. Now, together they have a daughter, she's Fatima. When she grows to womanhood, she then marries the cousin of Muhammad, and he's Ali. So Fatima and Ali together have two sons, Hassan and Hussein. So Hussein is the grandson of Muhammad, and the younger of the two sons of Fatima and Ali. Now, what makes them important is that we have a story recounted in the Quran that one day Muhammad goes into a room on his own, lies on the floor and pulls a cover or a blanket over him. And then successively he calls in these four other people, Fatima, Ali, Hassan and Hussein, and the four of them go under the blanket with Muhammad. Now we're told they are purified by God, so they are rendered the purest of all creation. So this becomes the holy family of Islam. Now for the Shia, this is a very important moment, because it shows that God has chosen that leadership of the worldwide Muslim community should come from this family and from this family alone. So this becomes the holy family of which all leaders of the community must be born. So after Muhammad's death, according to the Shia, the first person who should succeed him is Ali. And then Ali infallibly says that he should be succeeded by Hassan and Hassan by Hussein. So you get the picture. So for the Shia he is the third successor of Muhammad, the third of the Imams as they called them. The Imams are the worldwide leaders of the Muslim community. They are, as we would say, political leaders, religious or spiritual leaders, but also they are legal and military leaders. So they have all the, the reins of leadership in their hands. Now immediately after the death of Muhammad in 632, there was a dispute amongst the most over the question of who should succeed Muhammad. The majority of the community decided not to go with this election of the family of Muhammad, the Ahl al-Bayt, we say. In other words, as far as the Shia are concerned, they were deliberately breaking the divine command that it should be Ali who should succeed. 
Now you can see we we'll already have a tension that's growing here. This majority group who moved away, these are called the Sunni. The minority who stood firm beside Ali are called the Shia. And so right up to today we are aware of two groups of Muslims, the Sunnis and the Shia. And now we know their historical background. So after the death of Imam Ali, he was succeeded by his son Hassan. Now, there was a tension within the Muslim community because people didn't want this setting up of a leadership within a family. And so they said, we'll have anything else apart from that. Now, what happened is that a particular family amongst the Sunnis took leadership and everybody agrees that this family became corrupt leaders. Hussein didn't want to accept the leadership of this corrupt family and so he tried to pull away, to withdraw from the conflict, to withdraw from living under their rule and so he went to the holy city of Mecca now he knew that he was going to be asked to swear allegiance to this ruling family and he wasn't prepared to accept that and so rather than give in to tyranny to injustice he first withdrew to Mecca and then he set off on a journey to cross into modern-day Iraq to a place called Kufa this is the story of the beginning of the time of Imam Hussein and we've now reached the year 680 50 years after the death of Muhammad because as far as Imam Hussein is concerned uh, what is his relevance you know to religion in general we can say that all religion is about what do you hold to be most important what are the ultimately important things in life? What's the ultimately important thing in your own life? So one of the things that Islam would say is that truth and justice are centrally important in the lives of human beings. Human beings have a particular tendency towards justice. We seek to act justly we seek to follow the truth, to seek it out and to go with it. Now, how far are you prepared to go in searching for truth and justice? Hussein was prepared to go all the way. Hussein was prepared to go even to the point of death in a horrible way in order to defend the principles of truth and justice. So if somebody says to you, for the sake of a quiet life, for the sake of a lot of money, for the sake of a beautiful woman, are you prepared to give in to injustice in the world? Are you prepared to say what is untrue is really true? Now Hussein stands on the ground of justice and truth. So what happens is that in 680, he's traveling with a group of his companions. By tradition here, we're talking about 72 men plus women and children. And they're traveling across the desert toward Iraq, toward Kufa. They are shadowed by the army of this ruling family that's taken over leadership within the community. This army is massive. Again, by tradition, we're saying something like 30,000 soldiers. And they shadow them day by day in their progression. Until it comes to the place called Karbala. And in Karbala, they are surrounded. They can't go forward, they can't go back. Now, Karbala is a place without water. It's a place in the desert. It's the worst place you can imagine that you would want to be stranded. And now comes the question. Do you give in to the forces of injustice? 
to the forces of falsehood or are you prepared to stand your ground? And so what happens during these ten days of the siege at Karbala is that Hussein and his family are tested. Day after day the testing goes on. They're denied water. People go and try and get water and are killed in the process. The children are obviously crying, no water, no food. So Hussein on one occasion goes out and says to the enemy, look, I know you don't like me, but surely you don't want to take it out on a small baby. Please give water to the children. I'll leave the baby here on the rock. You can give him water later. And the child is shot in Hussein's arms with a bow and arrow. So you can see the tension is building up here day by day until we reach the tenth day. The tenth day is called Ashura day, the tenth of the month of Muharram. It's on this day that the massacre takes place. Now you can imagine, 72 men against 30,000. There is no discussion here about what the outcome is going to be. Hussein and his companions are killed. It's a massacre. After they've killed them, they desecrate the bodies. So they ride the horses backwards and forwards over the bodies just to smash them. And then they take the women and children away into captivity. Now you can see it was clear this was going to happen. What do you think if you've got 30,000 soldiers who are shadowing you and they are intent on seeing that you do not reach your goal? And yet Hussein goes forward rather than give in to injustice, give in to falsehood. And so he becomes a great role model for all Muslims, for the Shia especially. He becomes a role model of saying, we will stand on the principles of truth and justice. We will resist oppression. We will not give in even to the point of death if that's what God has ordained for us. Rather than accept falsehood and injustice, we will sacrifice our lives. This is why Hussein becomes important. Now something has gone horribly wrong in the Muslim community. Here we are 50 years, not quite 50 years, after the death of Muhammad, and we have the grandson of Muhammad being brutally killed in this way. Not only is he the grandson and the Imam, but he is somebody of the highest spiritual qualities, we can say, because he is somebody through whom God speaks, God guides the community. And so he sets a role model. A role model, we can say, that right will triumph over might. <clears throat> that even though you are few, even though you appear to be small, here we are, 1400 years later, and everybody remembers the day of Karbala. Everybody remembers the massacre. And so during these 10 days of mourning, Shia Muslims are reenacting, are remembering those days at Karbala, the days of the siege, the day of the massacre. And so they are, they are stealing themselves. Oh God, if it be necessary, I, true, will stand on the principles of justice and of truth. I will stand against oppression and falsehood. Now this is a challenge for all human beings. Whether we're religious or not, whether we're Christians or Muslims or anything else, where do we stand on the question of truth and justice? How important is it to us and to what lengths are we prepared to go? to defend these principles. Um, I mean, as far as Hussein goes, I mean, what exactly you know, can we learn from him? The important thing about the message of Imam Hussein is to say, this life is not all there is. 
there is something more important and that's the life to come and even for the sake of our own lives we are willing to sacrifice for the life to come secondly it's a message to say the whole of life is a risk from the moment you're born to the moment you die and so the question is what are those highest ethical principles those highest spiritual values for which you are prepared to risk everything not just your life but the life of your family too so it's a challenge to us to reflect on our own value structure what what would what is the relevance uh, as far as islam goes today in a modern society Islam believes that every single human being is born with a natural sense of justice, of truth, of, of uprightness. And so it's as though a word like justice can ring a bell in the heart of every human being and say, yeah, actually, that's got something to say to me too. So I think that a big bold statement like the day of Karbala rings this bell in the hearts of many human beings who actually believe if it's not fair it's not right if it's not just we ought to do something about it if it's not true we ought to take notice these things give us an ethic by which people can live by which people are challenged even if they choose not to live by it. So there we are. Hussein is a witness to us. Hussein is an example to us as human beings. What are our value structures? For what are we prepared to risk? And just how far are we prepared to go so that honesty, justice and truth should actually win in the world even at the cost of our apparently losing right at this moment. Thank you very much for the questions. I just met Chris Hewer, who gave me, gave me a talk on Imam Hussein from a Christian point of view. The man certainly has a, a passion and a knowledge for what, what he was talking about. But I do have a lot of other questions to, to ask regarding Imam Hussein, because I'm not exactly too sure who this guy is. And I will ask the next person I interview, Sheikh Musimin, about it. Because I found that uh, I was very interested in it, but I have, do have a lot of questions, and I didn't f sort of fully understand exactly who the man who said is. But I, I will discover, I'm sure I will discover on this journey, exactly who Imam Hussein is. After meeting Chris and getting an introduction to the biography of Imam Hussein alayhi salam from an objective point of view, it is now time to see how Imam Hussein alayhi salam is perceived by Muslims. David will now meet Sheikh Ma'asum Yan, a jurisprudential scholar who is well known and well respected in the North West London community. He said without Imam Hussein, uh, there is no Islam. Is that from a sheer point of view? Um, with regards to the hadith you just narrated, it is with regards to Islam as a whole, as the umbrella that takes in all the fractions underneath it. Um, the concept of Islam, the religion of Islam, the teachings of the, the Prophet, were all in danger of being non-existent, then less the uprising of Imam Hussein on the day of Ashura in Karbala would have taken place. It seems to be a lot of violence in getting to Imam Hussein's story. But Islam says that there is no violence in the belief. What is your view in general? The situation when it comes to, to, to violence and Imam Hussein is the fact that it, um, Islam um, and the situation where we had the wars with the Prophet and uh, such wars as the one that took place in Karbala 
is self-defense rather than the, them inflicting any violence. So if, even if you look at the, um, the figures, which I'm sure you've seen, for example, you know, some of the figures suggest between 10 to, to 30,000 people against about 72 to 73 people. Um, that would convey the sort of uh, tragedy that, that took place, although there was a huge amount of violence. Um, obviously, 72 people being attacked by you know, tens of thousands of people, the only thing they can do is defend themselves. So with regards to Imam Hussein's position, it was more of a defense um, than attack, although, although they knew the outcome and they knew what would, what would occur uh, on the day of Ashura. But the fact is, the state of affairs was such a low level that this had to take place for people to know the truth and for us today to examine it and look back onto it and see what occurred. Um, and unfortunately, obviously, there are still people that um, in themselves or in their hearts find the place for people such as Yazid, um, who was the leader of the people who attacked Imam Hussain alayhi salam. Um, however, if anyone takes a, a fair view of history, regardless of any um, different fractions that may exist or different ideologies that may exist or different th schools of thoughts that may exist, if they just take a, um, a point of view from the outside of looking at history um, without taking sides, they can see that it was a tragedy that was forced upon them by uh, people that had no respect for humanity as a whole regardless of children, women, um, the elderly, they were all slaughtered and tortured afterwards. Why do, uh, why, why do you think that the Revere Hussein um, in general? Shi'is in particular, the, 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 the Shi'a name means followers. Um, Shi is the reason that they're, they're, they're separated from other school of thoughts, if you want, mainly is because after the Prophet, um, they believe that Ali ibn Abi Talib, the um, cousin of the Prophet وسلم, should have been or was the leader that was put down by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, by God basically. And he was, it, it was, it's a divine intervention that leaders are put down on earth by God from the time of Adam, the, the, the Prophet Adam, until the last Prophet and the Imams after the Prophet, until the time ends, there's got to be an infallible divine leader sent down by God to guide people. Um, basically, we believe that it can't be that God creates everything and just tells you to um, you know, walk and talk and live as you, as you feel without any guidebooks or without any guidelines or without anyone showing you the way, as it were. Now, that, that being said, the third Imam after the Prophet was Imam Hussein, and it was also obviously the grandson of Imam Hussein. Within itself, an Imam in, in the uh, ideology and school of thought of Ahlul Bayt is very important, obviously. The fact that he was the grandson of the Prophet is very important. But the way he was martyred and the tragedy that took place during, before, and after the day of Ashura has a specific significance for every Shia. And as soon as you say Hussein, a certain place in their heart moves or a certain place, place in their mind uh, brings tears into their eyes. Why? Because it has a special significance. The uh, cutting of the water to, to everyone prior to the Abu Ashura. Um, the uh, inhumane way they were treated prior to the war taking place. When the war took place, the way they were slaughtered. It wasn't just a normal war. I mean, you know, uh, I appreciate you, you've read or, or seen some of the... Um, some of the facts that, that, yeah. that go with Al Shura. Yeah. And then afterwards as well. So after the Imam Hussein was killed and martyred um, in the way that it was, what happened to his family? For example, you know, if, if ladies are there, then at least in any war, ladies are kept respectfully you know, away from any violence. Instead, they were in the middle of violence. Instead, the, the, their tents were burnt. Um, instead, six year old, uh, a three year old um, girl cried for her father, Imam Hussein, and the head of Imam Hussein was brought in front of the girl. So these things that, that history has narrated is, is, is the, something that no human can possibly imagine. I mean, imagine um, someone being a leader of, of a particular country, and they realize that, you know, um, near, near their castle, a three-year-old three girl is crying for her father. And to, to make the girl quiet, they bring the head 
the, the, the head that has been taken off the Imam Hussein's body in, and put it in front of a three-year-old girl. What sort of mentality must that person have, or must, what must they have? And that for itself is like daylight, proves you know, who, what sort of people these were, regardless of what faith you are, regardless of what religion you have, just plain facts of history. Think, thinking, of, thinking about that, I mean, it's 72 against thousands, you know, good, 72 against 100,000. Is that suicide? What, it, what is the definition of suicide? This, see, when, when someone takes their life away, if you, you speak to any um, uh, uh, psychiatrist or psychologist, they will tell you that it's a selfish act, i.e. you don't care about others around you. You want to take yourself out of the situation, the hardship that you're in. So by killing yourself, you extract yourself from the hardship that exists around you at that particular time. That's suicide, basically. You kill yourself because of selfish means. However, if you look at what occurred in the day of Ashura, i.e. Imam Hussein knew that he was, he was going to martyr. There was no doubt about that at all. Imam Hussein knew what was going to happen, yet he went forward. The reason being is what we're here now. His martyrdom and his war against the injustices of his time is what led and lead thousands, if not millions, if not in the future billions of people in the right direction. So his, his martyrdom was the price that was paid to save Islam, was to save the, cor the correct way to survive in this world and have a beautiful afterlife afterwards and that price was paid by Imam Hussein and therefore that's why we believe Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala God has put such significance with regards to Imam Hussein those people that do ziyarah of Imam Hussein um, if they take one step towards him it's like a hundred uh, people it's like a hundred times doing hajj with the prophet and it's accepted um, if you have shed one tear from Imam Hussein your sins are forgiven why such significance on Imam Hussain and no one else? Because Imam Hussain gave everything he had. There was nothing else that Imam Hussain could do that he didn't do. There was nothing else he could give that he didn't give. Therefore, he has such a high place, and therefore the, the light is, is being lit for us now. That's why, not just yourself, but many journalists, or many historians, when they get to Imam Hussain, they do research. Why? Because it's, 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 it's a fascinating field. It's, 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 it's something that needs to be discovered by humanity. It's something that brings a question mark uh, with regards to those that were there at the time. Who was this man? Who was his family? Who could do this? The, the specifics of what occurred can guide many. The specifics of what occurred can guide very many people and have done so in the past. Is Imam Hussein the ultimate leader of all time? In some ways, yes. In some ways, you know, if, you, if you look at uh, his characteristic, characteristics and uh, the, the, the way that he conducted those few days in leading to his, his martyrdom, um, there is no, nothing similar to it. Uh, having said that, in our view, obviously, all the Imams are, are infallible and they're respectable. And obviously we have uh, the twelfth Imam who is among us, um, who, is against, uh, who is again the great-grandchild of the Prophet, peace be upon him. Um, yet, yes, there is a special uh, point about Imam Hussein where it doesn't exist elsewhere. What does Imam Hussein mean to you personally? To me personally? Well, it's, just, it's, it's probably something that can't be really answered in the, in the matter of minutes. But to me, he conveys to the entire world or conveys to anyone that wants to understand the truth how someone with the least amount of means, someone that is subdued in injustice, someone that is captured and uh, has no means of, of escape, someone who is uh, in a place in their lives or in a place that they're physically living, where they can't express themselves in any ways, and all the injustices are happening around them, yet he, er he, he makes an uprising, yet he rises against all those uh, injustices. 
yet he puts everything on the line that he could possibly have. I mean, for us it's very simple to say that yes, um, for, the, for a just cause, we'll be there. But how will you be there? Possibly by financing it, possibly by taking part in a march. When it comes to your own life and, and, and shedding your own blood, not many people can take that step and saying, yes, actually, you know what, I'll make a stand, even if I die. Even if they can that make that, uh, that step to saying, okay, it's for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it's for God, and I'm going to a greater cause, and I'm going to guide so many people behind me, so I'll give my life. How many people would then do the same with regards to their children, with regards to their sisters, with regards to their wife? putting their lives on the line as well, knowing that what would happen to them. Don't forget what knew what was going to happen to them. The fact that they're going to be tortured, the fact that they're going to be taken prisoners. Not many people, in fact, if, I don't know of any, that would take such steps in order to save humanity. You, you said, you said it's, it's millions go, go, to the, go to the shrine. Why do they go there? For what reason? Visiting the shrine of Imam Hussain alayhi salam again has a significance that no other shrine has. No other shrine at the moment has a significance of the, the significance that the shrine of Imam Hussain alayhi salam carries. Hopefully, if if one day you can, you can uh, take a week off work and you can you can visit and you can see for yourself uh, the miracles, if these guys or whoever can can capture it on film, possibly, um, because a lot of people, millions of people, literally walk. Because there's a special significance about walking to Karbala, walking to, to the shrine. And you see the amount of miracles that take place before they even get to the shrine, let alone when they get to the shrine. Um, the miracle of Imam Hussain is, is, is not something that's dead or something that's gone away. But in fact, it's, it's expanding day by day. Anyone that takes a step towards Imam Hussain, Imam Hussain takes steps step towards them. The, many of the blind have been cured. Many of the people that can't walk can walk. You see people that went on wheelchairs, they came back walking. You see people that went in blind, they, they, came, they came back seeing. That center, if anyone believes, if anyone truly believes, they will see so many miracles. Again, not only for the sick, or not only for those that need it, but any, anyone that needs to be guided, anyone that needs spirituality, anyone that, that wants to cleanse their soul. His um, shrine within itself has a significance in Islam, i.e. under the shrine, under the, under the particular dome where he's buried, we believe that all the du'as are accepted. So people go there to, to ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for many different things um, that they want in their lives or they want in their afterlives and so forth and so forth. But again, the motion of 12 million people in occasion of two weeks maybe, visiting this shrine that's in Karbala, where 3 million people go to Hajj and they get stuck. And there, 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 there is no way to, to, to resolve the situation. Where that yet you see that you know the, the, the food is continuous. You see people on the street all opening their doors to the to the visitors of Imam Hussein to allow them to, to sleep there. You see people that mass massage people's feet. You see people that wash their socks and, and, and return them to them. You see people that sell whatever cattle they have and, and, and kill them and, and feed the people that are going to do to do the ziyara. Every step that you take towards it is a miracle. Every step that, that you see uh, the Zawar of Imam Hussain, the visitors of Imam Hussain are taking, you see there's miracles within those. I think I might have to go there myself. You know, as soon as I get, as soon as I get some money, you know, I've got a lot of things that I could do with getting sorted out. I, I, hope, I, hope, I hope you do and I hope you get them. Yeah. Thank you, Sheikh Masuni. Thank you. You're most welcome. I've just spoken to Sheikh Masuni and and what I'm, trying, what I'm trying to think of it is to compare him with Chris Hewer, who, who I've also spoken to. Now, Chris Hewer's taking it from a Christian point of view, and Sheikh Masumian is taking it from an Islamic point of view. But Chris Hewer was taught straightforward, but I found Sheikh Masumian was more technical, and that sort of baffled me a little bit. But at the same time, I did find both of them very, very interesting to talk to, and I was able to feed off them to answer, uh, to ask them questions. What I learned from both of them is about Imam Hussein. Now, obviously, I've never heard of Imam Hussein before. I do know that they're Shia and they're Sunni, but I didn't know what the difference was between each of them. What I found, um, Imam Hussein was that he 
and his band of followers, and there was basically, what, 72 of them against 10,000, 20,000, 30,000. It doesn't really matter at the end of the day. This man believed in truth and justice, and that's what he strived for. Now, at the end of the day, the man got annihilated, and he died for his cause. So, so he was a martyr. If they were taught... If they were going to turn this into a Hollywood movie, it would be absolutely a fantastic story. And as an actor, well, I mean, I would love to play the part of Imam Hussein. Some people might say it's futile. I wouldn't say it's futile. I would say the man went for it and he believed in, he believed in himself. Now, this man also has a shrine in Iraq and millions of people go there every year to pay homage to this person. So at the end of the day, you, you, you've got to realise that this man is revered by Shias. I personally admire this guy because I believe in truth and justice myself. I'm not a Christian. I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I wouldn't even say that I believe in God. I would say that I'm agnostic. I don't know what if Muslims know what that means. What, what I believe in myself is that I believe that, that there's a force greater than us. But to call that God, I don't believe in that. But what I would say is, as far as Imam Hussein's concerned, I totally believe in him and I believe in what he set out to achieve. Just watch that Skies Wept Blood. What I found about it was... Although it was very informative and it told you about the story of Imam Hussein and the journey leading up to that, which took took quite a while to begin with. But what, what I did find about it was the first 30, 35 minutes of it were very interesting because it did tell you the exact story. But then it it, it went off the boil because... It was giving, uh, p people were giving their opinions. The people who who told the story of Imam Hussein, they were basically giving their opinions of, of what they thought uh, about Imam Hussein in general and what they, they thought uh, leads up to modern society. I did find that rather tedious and a bit boring, to be, to be perfectly honest. But as I say, at the beginning of it, the first half an hour was, uh, I wouldn't say enthralling, but it certainly got my my attention and I did find it very interesting and very informative. Now, after knowing basic facts and some of the deep underlying reasons why the Muslims love and have a dear attachment to Imam Hussein salam, it is now time for David to see how the lovers and mourners of Imam Hussein alayhi salam weep his martyrdom through the 10 days of Muharram. Um, thank, thank you, Ms. Johanna, and thank you for granting, granting us, us this interview. Could you expand uh, a bit more as far as mourning is concerned? T to the extreme where they're actually making themselves bleed? Yes. Could you give us a bit more info on that? Um, I mean, if you, if you think back, you know, to even when you used to be at school days and you're studying sort of, uh, you know, you're studying Greek, for example. I did classic civilization studies when I was doing my A-levels. And it was interesting because you, you talk about the Greek mythology and the Greek uh, uh, philosophers. And when they wrote about how they uh, noti uh, noted uh, a tragedy was that by the beating of the breast. Um, and this was not for men specifically or just for women. So this thing has been, you know, how do we convey an emotion of, of sorrow, of deep sorrow, you know, a real passionate sorrow of, of the passing of a loved one, for perhaps. Um, and writers have always, you know, sort of noted this thing down as you beat your chest with that sorrow. Um, so it, I think it's, um, it, it's something which is very um, uh, close to our for, uh, form. It's, it's not something that you teach yourself to do. It's a natural reaction. The natural reaction is once you are overcome by that sort of state of, the, uh, of passion uh, and, and, and mournfulness, it's a natural reaction. It's odd these days. It's because society in general has become 
um, a lot more sanitized in our in our reaction to things. We become a lot more um, you know objective, a lot more distant, a lot more sort of um, you know less passionate, I suppose. And it's it's not about religion. I'm talking about all relationships. You know, you don't see it's not common to see that sort of ex extent of wailing and crying on just when, on the passing of a loved one. You know, so it just feels like an alien concept now. But it, it's something which is it's in our it's in our it's almost in our original DNA from God when we were created to commemorate a, you know a so, a, a sorrowful occasion with the beating of the chest. It's just something that's manifested itself in that form. But why? I mean, why draw blood in the first case? That's a different thing. Um, there's, there's different things within um, the commemorative process. And that's a geographical thing you get. For example, um, the areas where obviously this thing has been developed. You've got the Arab countries, you've got um, the subcontinent, for example, India and Pakistan. Um, and within the Arab countries as well, you've got differences between... Iran, um, uh, the, where the, the Lebanese and the Iraqis uh, and, and other Arabs may commemorate things um, and how things are done in Pakistan. And there's lots of different things. I think what you've got to do is to understand that you've got the basic thing which everyone does, uh, which is the beating of the chest. Um, in Iran, what they would do is they would use a chain, uh, a handle with chains. The, the Lebanese, for example, uh, um, and Iraqis, what they would do is they would um, they use a, a small knife or a sword to actually mark, uh, you know, to cut draw blood from the head, um, and that is that is the oldest tradition that there is, and the significance of that is beyond mourning. Uh, it's beyond the whole per process of just mourning. That is actually commemorating the fact that when Imam Hussein lay down, when he was uh, martyred. He had so many wounds on his body. There wasn't uh, 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 any space on his body to actually be, take any more wounds. Arrows, spears, sword attacks, everything. Um, and the fact that you know he was struck on the head with the sword, that the fact that his, he was decapitated as well. Um, we, we are replicating that. When, when people are drawing blood, not from the chest, but in the form of uh, taking the knife to the head or to the back, etc., then you're commemorating, you're not mourning, you're mourning as well at the same time, but you are commemorating the fact that on that day, you, were, you, had, you took so many blows. And what was the essence of that? The essence of that was not personal. It was for the purpose of the, the propagation of, and the, the safety of, of Islam. So you did that. You took that sacrifice. You took those blows. So we're going to commemorate those because we weren't there. I mean, this, this is 2010. So... What, why is this still happening? In 2010, in the Christian community, people commemorate in the same way as, as the Shia Muslims do. Um, it's, not, it's not something specifically you can just say, well, okay, it might be uh, Arabs or, or Muslims or, or Christians, but from the Arab community, no. It's, it's all over the place. It doesn't happen in Europe. At least I'm not aware of it being commonly uh, taking place in Europe, but certainly in Far East Asia. Um, yeah, certainly in the Philippines have got a huge Christian community um, and if we, if we look at the origins of the crucifix I mean the crucifix is, is not a jewellery item it's something specifically to commemorate uh, the crucifixion of Christ Aside from Christianity is it a passion then as far as drawing blood is concerned? In a word yes but I think that the, there's a very simple reason for that. I think what we've established is that if you have that passion, then you are prepared to go to that extent. The reason why it happens to a much greater extent and is a lot more prevalent um, in the Shiite community is because the, the events of Karbala are unprecedented. You know, it's not happened to that extent. The atrocities have never been committed to that extent. In any, it's not commemorated, it's not noted in any other uh, religious history. And that's the reason why I think we, have, we, we do this more so than anywhere else, because I suppose there's no reason for the others to do that. Missing Johan, it's been very interesting. Thank you. When I first got involved in this, I didn't know exactly what to expect. I first went to meet uh, Chris Hewer, who is a Christian scholar who 
he knows about Imam Hussein. I, I asked him a lot of questions about what he told me, but I wasn't exactly too sure at that time who Imam Hussein is and what he had in relation to Shia Islam. I did, I did learn a lot from him and I found that he had a, a great passion for what he was talking about and his answers were concise and to the point. After that, I went to meet Sheikh Musumian, who gave me his point of view, obviously from a Shia point of view. His, his answers were the same as Chris, concise and to the point. And like Chris, I found he had a great passion for what he, what he was talking about. And that's, I, I do enjoy listening to people who do have a passion for what they're talking about in general, what, whatever the subject may be. Sheikh Musumian gave me a greater insight into exactly who uh, Imam Hussein is. And I also watched for the skies wet blood, which also gave me a bigger insight into it. I found Imam Hussein to be a person who stands for truth and justice. And he certainly stood for that all right, because he paid for it with his life and his followers as well. 72 people against 10,000, 20,000, it doesn't matter at the end of the day. They, they come up against a greater force than them, but he stood for what he believed in. And that's what I, I, I would like to think, that I stand for truth and justice in my own personal life. Unfortunately, the world as it is, that doesn't always happen. But I think if a person stands for that as an individual, then as long as they, they try to lead that path in life, then they should not they should go okay. Then after that, I met Missing Johan, who gave me an insight into why people basically beat themselves and, t to more extreme, draw blood. Now, I personally don't agree with that, but at the same time, this man also has a passion for what he believes in, and he, see, he justifies it for himself, why he draws blood. He did say to me that, you know, he, he has got scars on his back and he has non-Muslim friends who have seen that and questioned that. I would certainly question that as well because at the end of the day, you're beating yourself and I, I can't see that, I just cannot see that and I cannot grasp that. But at the same time, that is his belief. So, you know, that's down to him personally. From my own point of view, no, it's not for me. To sum up what I've, ex how I've ex experienced, I would say overall it's it's given me a, an insight into Shia Islam. I, I did not know anything about Shia Islam before. I certainly didn't know anything about Imam Hussein. I'd never heard of the person. I have learned a lot uh, and it has been very interesting uh, and I have enjoyed, have enjoyed it. Uh, to sum it up at the end, yes, a man who's saying as a person, I, I personally uh, think you could, uh, well, I personally think you can admire for other people who are non-Muslims, they would, they would have to discover it for themselves and make up their own mind. All in all, Imam Hussein has done a lot for uh, Shia Islam in general. And Shia, Shias obviously b believe in what, what he says and what, what he, he, he did to, sacri to sacrifice himself. For me, for me I, I wouldn't sacrifice myself in that way. But for him... He set out. He he set out that own path, and she is truly believing him. So, to sum it up, yes, you know, for she is, it, it's what it's what, and for them and for them in general, that is their that is their belief, and that's their God-given right in the end. <laughs>